This event has been curated around the findings of the latest retail innovation reports by the researchers at the Business Intelligence Service PSFK. Visit psfk.com to learn how you can download this report with a subscription to PSFK IQ, a library of 400 innovation reports and 150,000 supporting examples and data points. PSFK IQ, where innovators turn for research. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Retail Innovation Week. I'm excited to start a new session for this week of talks and discussions around key topics that are driving the future of retail. Uh, in today's session, we're going to have a research presentation, and then we're going to have an expert panel discussion. So we're going to start off with a presentation by my colleagues at PSFK, uh, and the retail intelligence team there are going to take us through a piece of research which is going to provide a kind of context and framework to the discussion today. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Latchett. I am the president of research and strategy at PSFK, and I am joined by my colleague, Lauren Lyons, who is a senior strategist on my team and who will help me present this uh, piece of research today, which is related to all things in-store technology and innovation. Lauren, why don't you say hello to everyone in the audience? Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to share this latest research with you. So as an organization, PSFK is always researching various topics. Um, we, have, we have a panel related to this very, this very same topic that we'll be running later today. But today we're just gonna share some highlights um, related to trends within the in-store uh, experience piece, specifically around technology, looking at things like AI, use of data, mobile, Internet of Things technology, et cetera, both from a customer experience and an operational uh, point of view as well. Just to kind of set the context here, we know that um, consumers are much more digitally savvy today. They're primed to expect things like personalization, convenience, and much more control within the context of their shopping experiences. Regardless of where that takes place, um, certainly they've been programmed to have certain expectations as a result of e-commerce. Those same expectations are now carrying over into the store as well. And so as retailers and brands begin to invest in these key pieces of technology, we're seeing new opportunities to deliver better experiences for consumers, better experiences for employees, and more operational efficiencies across the board as well. There's been a lot of conversation about physical retail and its potential death or demise, but we recognize that stores are still very important in the overall landscape today. Um, and let's not forget, um, just to put this quote up here, that people still say they prefer to shop in stores. We recognize that despite everything that has happened with the resurgence of COVID, people are still getting out and about, um, particularly around the holidays. We know that customer acquisition is very important within the physical store experience. And so there is the need and desire for companies to invest more in their brick and mortar business and the experiences that happen within those stores. We know um, again that the pandemic has changed the mandate for retail. It's not just about creating a store for people to shop, but there's an expectation for more to happen within those four walls. Um, and it's not as simple as creating Instagrammable experiences. It's more about building experiences that make people feel things. We know that e-commerce is very good at transactional. Physical is very good at the emotional. And so doubling down on that. Also recognizing that social and community are big uh, pieces of this and that there's a desire for those things to cross over with the digital world as well. Um, and support um, the digital experience uh, as well. We also know that consumers are entering into the physical store experience with a much more uh, 
sort of expectation for utilizing technology, particularly within the context of their mobile device, but then also through interactive uh, experiences, through displays and the like. Um, we can see here just some telling stats in terms of the number of consumers that are utilizing things like self-checkout, QR codes, apps, interactive displays, et cetera. Um, and this will play a role in some of the trends that we are talking about within the context of this presentation. This sort of the role that technology plays within the hands of the associate. Um, we know that consumers are walking into stores expecting much more from the associates who they're interacting with, both in terms of the level of service that those associates deliver, as well as the product knowledge that they have. And we can see that a large percentage of companies, 60%, are investing more in digital workplace technology for their associates. So that's things like mobile apps and all the tools that are part and parcel to that experience. And again, this is something that we will discuss as we look through this presentation today as well. So for the balance of this presentation, what we will do is take you through the seven trends that we have identified. Um, I think some of this is gonna be very familiar to you all in the audience, but in the interest of kind of sharing the latest and greatest, we wanted to talk through some of the trends that we're seeing as well as connect those to best in class examples from the marketplace. And so for each of these, we will discuss the trend, why we think it's happening, why it's important, and then share a, uh, an example as we walk our way through. And again, this is looking both from a customer experience point of view, as well as a operational point of view as well. So the first trend we want to talk about here is what we're calling responsive sales floor. And really, this is mobile devices within the hands of the consumer, but then also thinking about um, the role that interactive technologies within the retail store experience um, play a role as well. And so these are geared towards supporting the discovery experience, um, helping consumers navigate through that store experience in various ways, putting information and tools at their fingertips, and um, also including a level of perhaps personalization as well in terms of how you, what you understand about that consumer dictates the level of information that is being delivered to them as well. Um, helping deliver more convenience, that level of control that we mentioned, and then ultimately um, activating the store in a way that is going to create more relevance to that consumer as they shop. And so for this trend, we have a global example of innovation from a retailer called Modivo, uh, fashion retailers, inventory lists, uh, store in Warsaw, Poland. It's connecting its in-store shoppers to items from over 200 partner brands via connected tablets. So when shoppers arrive in store, they're able to comfortably lounge um, while digitally browsing items that are available to try on there in the store um, through connected tablets. So once they make these final selections, they're sent a unique code to their mobile phone and then can head to the fitting rooms. In the background, there are selections being chosen um, and sourced from an adjacent autonomous warehouse or stock room uh, for customers to try on. So when they arrive at the fitting room, shoppers input that unique code, are assigned a room, and that's where their items are delivered to them. And so each fitting room has customizable lighting um, and features touchscreen displays that showcase items that they've chosen, um, allows them to update those items and have new sizes selected and delivered. And then they're able to actually make those final selections in there as well. This example is really interesting because there is that level of automation that's happening here. We also think um, or recognize that content plays a huge role in the way that people are discovering and consuming products sort of more generally, bringing that kind of digital experience into the store and integrating that into the way that people are sort of shopping is quite interesting. In this case, this is obviously an inventory list store, but we could also see this playing a role just in terms of kind of complementing a more traditional kind of sales floor experience or even imagining a role where consumers are, are looking at that same content online or through their mobile device 
and sort of setting up a um, fitting room before they even get into the store. So kind of maximizing the um, that experience from a convenience point of view for them. And then as we start to see the, the level of items that people are kind of putting into their sort of fitting room or shopping cart, then the opportunity to, to sort of add in additional recommendations based on based on this as well. So um, really interesting to, to sort of consider how this fits not only within physical retail, but also just kind of um, that that more omni channel piece as well. The next idea that we want to talk about is augmented merchandising. And in some cases, this is a carry on to what we just spoke about. This is, again, thinking of the role that stores traditionally play in terms of that product experience. Obviously, people are coming into stores to touch, feel, experience, try on, test out the products that they're interested in. Um, in many cases, they're using stores as discovery, but then also to sort of add to the confidence that they have in the decisions that they're making. Um, we also recognize that in a traditional sense, people don't always get the fullest product experience by just putting on a shirt or trying uh, out a piece of electronics, um, sort of in a static setting, if you will. And so what we're seeing is that companies are now beginning to invest in technology enabled experiences that sit alongside those product trial opportunities to make them more interactive, give them more context in terms of how that product might perform or fit or ultimately connect to that individual's lifestyle um, in various ways. And so here we're calling out Situ Live, um, and it's billed as a discovery playhouse where guests within London's Westfield Mall are able to demo products from um, Situ Live's retail and brand partners within these live settings. So mm -hmm. thinking of like working kitchens um, and an entire decked out bedroom, entertainment center and more. So within these life lifestyle theaters, as Situ calls them, uh, shoppers are encouraged to go ahead and make a cup of coffee or listen to their own music on a featured sound system or speaker, um, test out a new sofa or chair while playing a video game, take a VR exercise course, or even try out workout equipment. And really by allowing guests to physically try before they buy, Situ's not only promising an improved purchase and brand experience um, with this like hand-on trial, but also leading to better product fits for each customer. And just to note for this as well, each item featured throughout the space features a uh, QR code as well that shoppers can scan, save for later, purchase um, how and when they feel. So just another element here. Yeah, and I, I really like this idea. Again, I think in some ways this ties into what we, the idea that we showed previous, which is a sort of not inventoryless showroom, but a much more limited kind of, um, inventory that's being put on display within the context of a showroom, but much more happening in and around that experience. It's it's a living showroom, things that people can get hands-on with in terms of products in various ways, and then um, additional content that sort of sits alongside of that to help complement and, and support the decision-making around um, a particular product. And then Again, some type of a fulfillment mechanism that sits in the background so that even if a product is not sitting on a display that you can physically walk out with, there's a way to get that delivered or in the hands of the consumer before they leave in that particular day. And tied alongside of the um, augmented merchandising that we just spoke about, there is also this desire to add more theater, um, create more unique one-of-a-kind moments within the context of physical retail, um, particularly, again, as we think about how you encourage consumers to continue to sort of enter the store um, and create shareworthy experiences. And so if the previous trend was around product experience, this is in some ways product plus brand experience, really sort of doubling down on that. Um, emotional connection that you can create with consumers, 
um, creating aspects of entertainment, education, things that people um, can't ultimately get sort of online. Um, and again, perhaps even um, delivering social experiences or things that people can sort of experience together in uh, a physical location. So, um, you know, I think there's some really interesting ways that brands and retailers are beginning to experiment with this. So here we're calling out the Lego store, um, their New York City flagship, which is a blend of both digital and physical experiences. Um, features things like the Mosaic Maker, Minifigure Factory, and just different ways that they're bringing that brand, um, a brand's product to life through one-on-one um, -on -one experiences and personalization. So for shoppers who arrive, they can go to or stop by the Brick Lab where it's an immersive VR experience that teaches you all about Lego and really gets you into the world um, of Lego. And then from there, you get to head towards the personalization studio. Um, where you're able to create mementos using something called a mosaic maker. And this captures each visitor's portraits and then creates actual Lego versions of yourself. Um, from there, you get to head towards the minifig minifigure factory. And this is another personalization option where you can design and create um, unique Lego minifigure characters. You get to put a custom name on it and you leave with a special box. And an important part that makes this like a real marquee moment as we're calling it is that this New York City location was designed specifically to reflect the city. And while Lego is planning out to planning to roll out similar flagships and experiences in other cities, um, each store's activations and design are going to be customized to reflect those locations, offering that really like unique city-specific experience. And, and I love I love that point, Lauren, about the sort of local aspect or reflecting the community in which the store um, exists. And having these digital experiences enables you to do so in a way that is much more flexible in terms of kind of adapting that. And then the other thing I think that's worth mentioning um, with all the examples we've, we've showed so far is there's sort of this underlying level of interactivity, which sort of carries with it this sort of data capture component, which is important to consider anytime you're sort of implementing technology into a store where you're able to understand much more how people are interacting within that store experience, the things people are walking out with, what is drawing them to a particular display, what are the elements that they're customizing, what are the common sort of features that they're kind of clicking on, et cetera, et cetera. In aggregate, all of that information can sort of drive smarter decision-making about how the store is laid out, how, um, customers might be engaged within the context of the store and even help um, sort of drive decisions around product choices and inventory and things of that nature as well. So while these technologies are sort of serving a sort of um, specific experience or a very focused experience, there's, there's other aspects that are sort of working in the background as well that add more value to that investment too. Shifting away a bit from that sort of aspect of the consumer facing experience more to that operational piece, we want to touch on what we're calling connected infrastructure here. Um, this really kind of follows on what I was just talking about, which is recognizing that in today's sort of retail environment, it's important to kind of close the gap in terms of what you're able to understand about who customers are and what customers are doing within the context of a physical retail setting. That could be a shopping mall, it could be an individual store, um, whatever the case might be. But ultimately what we're seeing is that um, companies are making the investment in things like image recognition technology, um, location specific um, GPS uh, technology, and even things like um, location specific AR in order to um, not only capture and understand who consumers are and what they're doing within the context of the space, but then also to um, connect with them on an individual basis or at least a more personalized basis um, based on the things that they're doing, who they are, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so here we have an example from the ARIA network in Brookfield Properties. And so we're highlighting this AR driven partnership between the two. Um, and with ARIA 360 degree AR, shoppers using their mobile devices within any one of Brookfield properties, more than 100 malls, are going to be able to access and navigate each shopping center's directory, um, find in store promotions, interact with content, and then also engage with these immersive retail displays and complete touch free transactions. So, by using this connected network, retailers are able to not only meet their customers with relevant ads and promotions really in the moment and in real time, but they're also offer, able to offer this more immersive, hands-free, convenient, mobile-driven experience, both in their own stores and throughout the property. Yeah, I think there's a couple interesting things happening here. Obviously, once you start talking about shopping centers, you've got multiple brands and retailers that are all kind of sharing a, a roof, if you will. And once these companies begin to share information about their customers in aggregate, again, it creates more value for everyone that um, are involved within the context of this. And then what we're seeing here is the power or potentially promise at least of sort of in-store ad networks. And we see a number of companies really kind of pushing forward with this, um, the Walmarts and the targets of the world, um, Kroger's, et cetera, and I'm sure I'm missing a whole host of others, but um, getting to that point where you can potentially deliver messaging or content that is relevant to that particular consumer in the moment based on who they are, where they are, et cetera. And, um, you know, that adds value not only for the retailers and brands, but then, um, you know, when utility or relevance or personalization are all kind of being delivered to the consumer, it really helps them have a better experience overall as well. We talked about mobile in the hands of the consumer. Um, certainly there is power in putting those same tools and technologies in the hands of associates as well. Um, what we're beginning to see is that, A, there's an expectation for um, from employees today to want to have the tools that they might be using in their normal lives um, to be as useful and as simple within the context of um, their own day-to-day -day jobs. We're seeing these tools be used to sort of streamline communications between um, members within a store, uh, or not members, excuse me, associates within a store, associates and HQ. Um, have this play a role in terms of how they're um, sort of choosing to do uh, what tasks they're doing on their day to day um, in their day to day jobs also have access to valuable information to cultivate relationships with customers locate products be more um, intelligent or educated around the products that they're talking about. There's a lot of different things that are happening here, but ultimately this is about empowering associates and really kind of doubling down on the importance that they already play within the physical retail experience and just kind of give them um, uh, better tools to um, succeed within that role. And so to really overhaul, overhaul their entire in-store experience, Sally Beauty Holdings partnered up with Zebra Technologies, and they've been able to modernize store operations and power associates um, by translating all manual tasks that they were performing. So payroll systems, scheduling, um, and also just product lookup into a single dashboard and mobile app. And so associates now are outfitted with tablets. They can access schedules, to, um, handle virtual store tours, and also um, uh, handle curbside pickups and alerts, communicate with their teams in real time. So now rather than having to call store managers individually, um, communication between Sally Beauty's corporate teams and store teams is more fluid, taking place in real time. And then at the same time, employees are more easily able to help customers access additional product information, uh, complete purchases, and then also just complete day-to-day -day tasks in more streamlined and efficient manner. Yeah, needless to say, there's a lot of great examples of solution providers and companies that are implementing um, these types of 
uh, technologies into the context of their store level workforce and the level of efficiencies that that can deliver, but also the um, ability to really up the customer experience. And then I think the other thing to mention is, you know, there's, there's a much higher expectation and a greater number of tasks that a sort of typical associate needs to sort of be able to complete on a daily basis. And so this really ups the game in terms of what an associate is able to do and do more efficiently so that um, ultimately they can focus more on their most important job, which is their um, face-to-face customer interactions as well. One of those tasks that we are seeing um, in-store staff have to take on um, much more um, much more today than in previous uh, sort of moments is picking online orders um, either for local de- delivery or for buy online, pick up in store. Um, particularly when we start thinking about big box retailers or grocery stores, there's a huge amount of product assortment. There are um, you know, stock outs that happen as a result of um, all of these various um, orders that are happening both in store and online. Um, There's locating those products, there's making sure that there's accuracy associated with those as well. Um, And so there's a real need and um, and, an early stage of investment within technologies that are helping make that order picking process much more streamlined. Um, One of the things that we're starting to see is things like augmented reality or other visualization technologies begin to play a role in helping associates do that job um, much more efficiently. Um, and again, save, save them time and, and make sure that they're um, delivering an accurate uh, quality experience. And an interesting example of this trend coming to life is this hands-free AR-assisted order picking solution from Team Viewer, and it's helping associates to locate products, complete fulfillment orders, all within the heads-up Google Glass display. So Google and Team Viewer's um, AR order pick, pick order picking solution as a hands-free application. It's leveraging that Google Glass smart glasses equipped with the software. And so as BOPSIS and e-commerce orders come in in our process, associates are able to receive that information um, that they need to fulfill those orders all within the display of the Google Glass through a connection to the retailer's order fulfillment system. So inventory is being updated in real time. And so this head up, heads up display capability is actually enabling associates to use both their hands to locate, pick items correctly um, and better navigate stores. At the same time, it's providing um, data insights to retailers who are looking for like increased demand of cus- customers who are interested in that buy, na- buy online, pick up in store, or same day delivery options. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, this we're sort of on the precipice. There are a number of companies, Facebook, Niantic, um, I'm probably missing a whole bunch of others, Snap, et cetera, that are all sort of... Um, soon to put um, wearable AR into the context of uh, the marketplace. I think early on, these more sort of operational um, use cases are going to be the things that are that are going to add real value to the way that these technologies can play a role. But certainly, um, you know, we can see this uh, eventually sort of shifting into a consumer facing experience as well. But for the purposes of this, again, we're thinking about um, helping associates or um, back of house staff within a warehouse or, or what have you be more efficient in terms of how they're able to do their jobs. And then the final trend that we want to talk about is what we're calling inventory intelligence. And again, this is very foundational to a lot of what we've already spoken about today recognizing that um, at an individual store level um, and sort of, again, in aggregate, as we're thinking about omni-channel operations, it's important to recognize um, what inventory is available at any given point in time, um, have that be available in real time, both to um, partners within the supply chain, associates who are 
um, working at a store level and potentially even to customers who are shopping either in store or through a mobile device or, or online to recognize um, you know, what is an accurate reflection of inventory at any given time. And then um, alongside of that is also this sort of notion that even in a specific region or a specific city like New York City, for example, that individual stores within specific neighborhoods have slightly different um, demographics of individuals who are shopping there. Um, and the product mix needs to be um, reflective of those same consumers. And so recognizing that there's a lot of different um, technologies available in the marketplace today that are helping um, ensure that accuracy, um, ensure that transparency of inventory, and then help make smarter decisions about the merchandising um, that is happening on a store by store basis as well. And so this last example is um, coming from PepsiCo, PepFizz, and to really optimize its own product assortment within stores and help its retail partners as well. The Food and Beverage Corp de developed its own cloud platform um, that's able to track inventory from store to store. So um, using different forms of um, data science and analytics, the platform is tracking inventory store to store. You're able to observe purchase patterns at a local level and also ensure that a shelf or online channel is featuring an optimal product mix based on those consumer data and insight points. And so by helping its own internal teams to better understand consumer preference and behavior across all of its locations, the company is better able to tailor product selection, selection but also um, impacting things like production, improving sales, and then delivering that greater customer experience by store. Amazing. So thank you, Lauren, and thank you to everyone who has listened in to this portion of the presentation today. Um, just to remind you, PSFK produces, um, this is a snapshot of one of the, the reports that PSFK produces on a weekly basis. These are reports that are directly inspired by our membership and or um, things that we think are interesting within um, PSFK internally that we want to share with our membership. Um, one of those reports has multiple trends, more examples than we've showcased within this, a bunch of great insight in terms of stats and quotes that help to support some of the thinking that we've um, included within this as well. We touch on various aspects of different industries, different aspects of the purchase path, um, different technologies, all sorts of things. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, then please reach out to our colleague, Jeff Wiener. You'll see his email down below. Um, and thank you very much. Excited to continue this conversation in the in-store technology panel that will be happening a little bit later. Thanks, everybody. That was a great session. I provide a lot of context, provide a framework in which we can think about innovation when it comes to this topic. Let's move on. Let's learn more and let's have this panel discussion. Let's take a look at who's speaking today. For our in-store technology innovation session, we have Philip Warb is the founder and CEO of On Demand, sustainable custom furnishings company model number and a co-founder and board member of retail as service company Beta. Also on the panel is Imogen Weather Ed, who is the CEO and founder of Quadini, a retail choreography software provider that helps retailers and banks better manage and analyze their customer experience and business operations. Trevor Sumner is the CEO of Perch, the leader in interactive product engagement marketing retail displays that consistently drive sales lift. And finally, Eric Mogill is the Chief Growth Officer of Next Generation Retail Tech and Computer Vision Inventory Management Company Radar. If you're watching live, a number of the speakers will be engaging with the audience using the interactive chat, ask questions and make comments throughout the event. Now, let's join the moderator Scott Latchup from PSFK to start this session. Excellent. Philip, Imogen, Trevor, and Eric, thank you so much for taking time out of your days. 
Um, very excited to be talking to you all about all things technology related, specifically as it applies to the physical retail experience. And I'm sure we will touch on a number of topics here today, but I wanted to kind of start off a little bit broad and um, you know think about the state of the store just sort of more generally within the context of the current retail landscape. Obviously, we're still at a moment where digital is um, the thing that people seemingly are talking a lot about. We're in a sort of little moment where um, stores are somewhat more perilous again to be entering into. Um, we know that omni-channel as a broader retail strategy is very important for companies to be considering. So um, to open up the conversation, either from an operational or a customer experience perspective, um, what do we feel the role of the store should be um, within the, the current landscape? And maybe, Eric, uh, I will throw it to you first for um, your thoughts. Always put me on the spot. <laughs> Um, so I think we're in, it, it's clear we're in a transformational time just because of COVID and all of the rapid change uh, in, in culture and physical retail today. I don't necessarily think where we are even today, which is different than where we were in 2020, will be where we might be in a year or two from now. But what I can say is there's been a few major changes, at least what we've seen at Radar from, from speaking to the top retailers. One, physical retail isn't going anywhere. So a lot of people like to say physical retail is dead. People aren't shopping. I think you can see from traffic at the stores, and I, I see Trevor nodding in agreement that it's not dead, hopefully, um, in that even though there's a pandemic, et cetera, physical retail still plays a huge role for retailers. One, it's great for customer acquisition. Two, there's a lot of showrooming happening. People still, especially in fashion, apparel, accessories, beauty, want to try, smell, touch the products um, to see fit, to see um, all of these other things. So customer acquisition, showrooming still makes a need to at least go to the store for the first time. Nike will tell you that their, their top uh, customer lifetime value customers come in through a store first, and they're able to build that relationship, and then they can move them online and put them into CRM and market. The other second point I'll make before passing to the group is that uh, retailers are in some of them in five to 10 year leases, but they still see a value for their stores. You know, um, Amazon has 110 distribution centers around the country that are state of the art, whereas most retailers don't have nearly close to that, but Target has 2000 stores. And for that last mile and competing with Amazon on e-commerce, they do a lot of ship from store because it's 40% cheaper and it's 90% cheaper if people do curbside pickup, which as you get into Walmart and big box retailers and groceries still plays a value. So their store networks are really becoming this distribution network for them, for their e-commerce businesses to get customer uh, products faster. So whether it's customer acquisition and just, you know, acquiring the top CLV customers or distribution network, I think those, it has forced retailers to adopt technology faster that enables them to be operationally excellent and better at that. Eric, I, you saw me shaking my head. I, I think, you know, this, it's amazing that it's 2022 and we still talk about retail maybe being dead or physical retail being dead. And, but, you know, you, you know, even the way you talk about it, it's like, there's still a role for the store. It's like, yeah, it's where 85% of transactions still occur for the first time Q3 last year, uh, in-store was growing more on a percentage basis uh, than online. The first time since 2008, it's been growing every, every year more on a dollar basis, except for 2020. And, you know, you have target retail, in-store retail growing on a dollar basis at five times faster. Like, I think 2022 is going to be the year where, like, we really start, you know, dealing with the reckoning of delivery economics, whether it's return rates that are in-store is 63% lower or the fact that Instacart charges you $50 for a $30 item, like it's just not sustainable. Um, and the other part about it is like, you know, over the last week and a half, I, I've gone to Tiffany's and Nordstrom and, you know, bought jeans and gone shopping with my wife. And it's so wonderful to go shopping. We real, realize that 
you know, to, to Eric's point that the larger, you know, customers in terms of spend, they spend about five times more if you're an omni-channel customer than e-commerce. Uh, it has a 37% more impact on loyalty. So I actually think 2022 is going to be the year where people start really talking in a more aggressive tone that like stores are actually the key to building brand, to building loyalty. And that e-commerce is like, it's transactional. It's like Apple Pay, right? It's like, I know what I need to buy now and I will go buy it, but how I choose what to buy and who I buy with will be determined more by stores than almost anything else. And so the question for us is, how do we enable that future where people choose those brands and those retailers based upon the in-store experiences that we create through technology, through digital, through unified commerce. And that's really the exciting piece to me. Awesome. Yeah, I would um, agree with that. So we, I would say um, omnipresence. Um, so stores are about being able to be omnipresent. Um, looking at like the Bonobos and the Warby Ward Parker um, examples where they didn't have stores and they became a lot more well-known with consumers and their stores accounted for significant proportions of their sales. We've got it in one of our recent white papers. Um, as well as, I don't think we've mentioned service, um, but building that relationship with the customer through service. So where you can automate some processes, that's fine, but redeploy team members to delivering service and building long-term relationships with customers. Yeah, I think that's that's all really great stuff. And I think I'll throw it to you, Philip, but I want to just kind of like go a little bit deeper because um, <clears throat> one of the things I think about is obviously, you know, you have your big established brands and your big established retailers, but then we're also seeing, seeing as Imogen mentioned, like these direct-to-consumer brands that are seeing value in sort of moving away from Facebook and Instagram to acquire customers, as Eric mentioned, into the store as a, as a place to do so. And so as we think about, um, you know, all of those aspects that we've just touched on, I wonder what we see as the sort of foundational technologies that are sort of essential to kind of um, allow some of these experiences to happen. And, and Philip, recognizing that you with Beta have done some very interesting things in terms of how you've built relationships with um, smaller brands and then the, the services that you're sort of providing to them. I wonder if you can kind of start us off there. Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, look, I always kind of balked at the term of um, kind of omni-channel, right? I mean, because to me, it was always about commerce, right? You have to look at it holistically in the whole aspect of things of like how you're doing business. It's not about, you know, as Trevor mentioned, I think it, it becomes very transactional um, when you look at purely just kind of the e-commerce play. And, and you have to look at the whole broader, you know, scale and, and spectrum of things. You know, when I was at Beta, we used, people used to ask me, well, like, what is your, you know, where are you spending the, the vast majority of your marketing dollars? And I said, well, like, we really don't spend a lot of traditional, we didn't have a traditional marketing budget, right? Most of what we would do was, it was about real estate. It was about being in the best places and having the, the, you know, the best locations. When we went into Hudson Yards, we had an opportunity to take a bigger space, but I chose to go right there in the corner, you know, fishbowl right next to blue bottle right next to the escalator so that when people would come up they would come in and they would see all of this action and things happening you know and when we opened that location we had sixty thousand people coming in a month into a space that was 1500 square feet right again because it's about engagement and and it wasn't necessarily about transactional it was about engaging with customers it was about providing great service it was about providing you know unique products and, and having a differentiated story um, and, you know, I think you really have to kind of lead in, lean in, excuse me, to, um, to various aspects of, you know, both just traditional kind of human psychology of how people kind of react towards things, but at the same time, then you have to provide those technological solutions to make it very easy and seamless for people. I mean, we've seen that, you know, happen uh, a lot over the last two years. Um, we're doing that right now at, at model number. We opened up our first pop-up um, and I think our business just transformed immensely over the last three months, just, you know, having that physical component, you know, attached, you know, back to um, the digital aspect of what we were doing. Yeah. And to, to piggyback on that for technology, I think you're hearing more and more that 
if, if we're on the same page that stores have a tremendous value, if you're a D2C brand, you can't go from 100 million to a billion without physical stores. And it's about that experience and engagement and service. You can kind of break down technology into solving the kind of three to four big problems that retailers are talking about, especially given the supply chain and labor issues that we've been hearing about. One, can you help with inventory productivity and fulfillment? Can you enable them to do this distribution and those delivery economics? Two, labor efficiency to what Imogen said. Can you make the store associates more efficient or automate certain things so that they can be engaged in that service that Philip also spoke to? Three, data. 80% of Target's revenue comes from their stores, but all their data is online. That's why you're seeing Best Buy, Macy's, et cetera, launch these in-store ad networks, right? Because they're so, so rich in data to help with that experience. And then the fourth thing is just customer experience, surprise and delight to make things memorable. So there's technology in all of those areas. I would say what we're doing and a technology that we're seeing at Radar is RFID and computer vision. So if you think about it, RFID tags used to be 20, 30, 40 cents. Now they're three cents. So you can see anyone from Uniqlo to Gap to H&M to Zara to Target for all their apparel are tagging items with RFID so they can track it along the supply chain. What Radar does and other companies that create fixed sensors to read RFID is they tell you where all the products are in real time. So if you need to pick an order, uh, for fulfillment, if you want to know that the product is even in the front or back of the store and that a customer didn't pick it up, you can get that kind of access. So that's in the inventory piece. And then computer vision is what Amazon Go and Standard Cognition do for grocery stores and convenience stores to help with automated checkout so that their staff can provide service up front. We use it for the same thing and data and analytics. So what items are people reaching for? What are they looking at? all the rich analytics you get on e-commerce, could you leverage those to drive an ad network or to drive, as, as Philip would say, a total understanding of that customer to deliver them the right experience? So there's a lot of technology innovation. I think even what Trevor's doing at Perch falls into that arena as well in customer experience. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing about the store, right? Like there's a lot of focus on, on some of the operational side of the house, um, but I, you know, we really don't know what goes on in the store. There's a lot more art than science. And if you look at what Beta did in terms of really innovating by providing brands a bunch of different metrics as to how people interact with their products in store, the reality is we don't know a lot of that. Um, and I'll give you one example is, you know, if you ask anybody what's the most valuable, you know, placement on a planogram for an end cap, they'll tell you eye level or eye levels by level, you know, 100% of the time, literally 100% of the time. And we've instrumented it and we actually see that the edges are much more valuable. And so customers actually interact with products differently than the entire industry thinks because we've just never been able to shine a light on it because it's like the greatest data desert is in store where 85% of transactions occur. And an underlying theme of all of the innovation that you're seeing, I, I don't like to think of data, Eric, as like a separate thing. It's because Ultimately, it underlies everything that we're doing and all new decisions these days have to accompany data. And I, I agree with you that computer vision is the most exciting because it's giving us eyes into the physical world of what's happening in store more than just heat maps, but product level interactions and RFID tags. And what's cool about Radar is it's like, you know, within what, like a third of an inch or something like that, three centimeters. I mean, you know exactly where things are, when they get moved, like what are we going to learn about the way people shop, the way we merchandise, the way do our promotions work? How does 20% versus 30% versus 40% affect, you know, behavior? How does that shift by demographic? We're going to start to see these things and apply that same digital competency that we see online, which has been the inherent advantage of e-commerce and that growth. And now we're going to apply it where all the profitability in retail occurs and 85% of transactions occur. It's a super exciting time. Awesome. I, I love to hear um, all this excitement and I, I like to hear that sort of like data being integrated kind of in all solutions in some way, shape or form in order to kind of justify the solution in and of itself, but then enable all of these kind of larger decisions and intelligence about what happens within the store. Um, from your perspective, Imogen, like how are you guys um, approaching it in terms of how your how your technology is um, 
you know, sort of helping your retail partners um, in store? So, yeah, so we are focused on customers. So we call it cu customer choreography. So basically kind of choreographing how your customer moves around the store. So um, the first piece is appointment scheduling, um, which we've seen a massive trend in since the start of the pandemic, um, particularly also virtual appointments. We've looked on Google Trends and basically if you search virtual appointment, um, it's basically flat until the start of 2020 and then it just jumps up and it's kind of stratospheric growth. So um, it was obviously like a trend that was kind of maybe going to happen um, we surveyed consumers and found that um, millennial and Gen Z customers are twice as likely to want virtual appointments than baby boomers. So actually, this is a trend that's going to stay. It's something that the younger generations would have wanted that we've only realized because of the pandemic. Um, and then there's appointments coming into store for services, um, as well as kind of managing customers when they come in the stores. So it's kind of like that Apple retail walk-in experience that you go in, someone greets you, they understand what you need. You then can go and browse the store and then out of no one, out of nowhere, someone comes and finds you. They know your name. They know exactly what you want. They've built, they've kind of uh, create, uh, bought up your CRM profile, et cetera. And then the third one is, um, well, actually also helping with events. Um, so event booking in online and in store. Um, as well as curbside pickup. So when customers come to store, um, they can check in from their phone and it beeps on a retailer's tablet so they can go get the customer that order, whether that's at the curbside or even at the desk. We've been able to reduce three steps in the usual process of collecting customer, uh, giving a customer their order. Um, so yeah, so those are the key ways we're helping retailers. And it was interesting to see the pandemic because before that, and when we went to NRF, um, there was a massive focus on operational tools. Um, and I was thinking, what are we doing with the business? Like, should we be building more operational tools into our own product? Um, and I think the pandemic refocused people on what is important, which is the customer and making sure that they feel safe and engaged and able to get what they want from the store or online. So I'm curious to kind of build on, on this, um, obviously knowing now that there's, you know, a variety of data that's being captured in terms of what's happening within the store. Um, as Imogen just mentioned, there's this ability now to sort of have a much more direct line of communication with that consumer and engagement. Um, obviously, personalization is something that is discussed um, quite a bit in terms of the overall experience. We know that this is something consumers say they want. Um, as we think about this from a, an in-store perspective, what are the ways that that sort of shapes itself in the future? What is, what is personalization going to look like in the coming years? One of the things, and I think there's, there's been a lot of it, a lot of here about kind of data capturing. And, um, and I think one of the things you still have to kind of look at, well, it's great having machine learning and understanding kind of what behavioral elements are the anecdotal and kind of the aggregation of actual human interaction and being able to capture that information is the most valuable thing that I think I've found, right? I mean, even, you know, like at beta, we were, obviously we were still kind of early stages of um, where things are at now and where things have moved to some of the more AI and machine learning, but, you know, we had information and we had things, but at the end of the day, people really, our partners and we worked with, they, they were interested of, of what was kind of going on and what was happening kind of with the cameras and where people were shopping and how they were inter interacting and engaging with product. But kind of going back to what Imogen was talking about, like, you know, this experience where you walk in, it's still that one-on-one -on -one human interaction. And to me, you know, what I do, like I sit down every Monday morning with the management team at our pop-up and say, okay, walk me through everything that happened this week. Like, you know, walk me through every transaction. What are customers talking to you about? What are they saying? What, I, that's the stuff that, that we use that's so invaluable that, you know, I still think that, that that's a, that the in-store piece, you know, as Trevor was talking about it, just kind of this vast kind of wasteland of, of lack of information still that we have, that is, that, that's the way to do it. And I think anyone that can kind of build some sort of technological solution where that allows the stores, you know, we were using Slack, which is very rudimentary, obviously, just to kind of have everyone aggregate through notes and, and, and try to kind of collect that into um, some semblance of um, a story. I think that's that's going to be really critical because that that's still where the magic and, and I think in, in all of the, the richness of, of 
data truly exists is, is like, what are people actually telling you? What are they saying versus necessarily kind of how are they maybe physically interacting with the product? Right. So, so more, more qualitative um, level data than, than perhaps just the sort of behavioral or what, what have you. The qualitative is, is also like, I think people underestimate sometimes. Got it. Well, I, I think part of that is just the lack of quantitative in store, right? Like when we talk about personalization online, it's like, well, where did Trevor click? And he's a 45 year old male. And I, you know, bought some data that said he makes this amount of money, lives in New York and da, 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 da. Um, and we don't necessarily have that data in store. We're starting to get that data. And so when I think about personalization in store, like one is I see people deploying tools that allow you to personalize your experience. So, you know, all the virtual try on experiences, trying on makeup in store and kind of, we we're working with Johnson and Johnson and have deployed like a skin scanning technology. They call Neutrogena Skin 360 that scans your skin and then personalizes a regimen just for you. So I think like a lot of it will be tools where, part of the user, you know, shopper navigation is them choosing their own adventure and where they go in the store and what they do and what tools they interact with. And to Philip's point, part of that is how do we start aggregating that, you know, at a customer level so that we can continue, you know, putting these data points together. But I, I think part of that also is, and, and what, what I think is really interesting is thinking about that next generation is like, we actually look at at Perch, which products people touch, which is almost like clicking on a product. If I pick up a product, I'm interested in it. Can we start creating profiles, you know, about what people do? And, you know, part of the, the problem there is just around privacy and like, how do you like visually recognize me? And, you know, I don't see that being solved anytime soon, but the, the key is the mobile phone. And so the, the, the next frontier is where the shelves and what I do in the store to be synced up to my mobile phone in some interesting real way where loyalty, like if I pick up a product and the coupon for the product comes up on my phone, that's pretty cool, right? And so, you know, once we start kind of putting the dots together for that quantitative, you know, kind of journey in store, uh, I think we're going to have a lot more data points for optimization, personalization, you know, both in the store and when they leave. It's interesting because the way that you talk about it, Trevor, is obviously there's a value, there's value in that sort of moment where you're actually garnering information about a particular customer. They're opting in in some way, shape, or form, at least for that one interaction. And then you're touching on the sort of CRM piece that I think Imogen sort of mentioned and sort of thinking about how that all kind of stitches together in, in interesting ways and what that ultimately means in terms of how a store can begin to respond to people differently. And Eric, you obviously mentioned the sort of like in-store ad network as well, which, which plays a role too. So, um, yeah, and, and just just to add to that, I I don't think that the stores have done. I, I'm not aware of many stores that have really done a great job of converting the shopper experience into mobile and CRM capture. That tends to happen at checkout, where they try and sign you up and get the loyalty. But you know, for example, you've got electronic shelf labels, which are much more popular in Europe than in North America, part because of labor costs and other things. But we're starting to see them in North America. Best Buy Canada adopting some technologies here. So where you know the, the the shelves themselves will encourage you through QR codes and NFC to sign up and and get and get coupons and so that this data can be something that happens throughout the store experience, not just at that last point when you're leaving. The and store. we've obviously talked a little bit about the sort of customer facing side of things, and we've we've hinted at the operational piece, but I'm also curious to sort of think again around the employee experience and what's important in terms of the tools that companies should be considering investing in. Um, and so I will throw that to you, Imogen, to sort of start start off. If if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean your your tool set is specifically geared towards employees. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about some of the sort of ways that companies need to think about implement like from a best practices point of view kind of bringing these technologies to bear for the for that employee in store 
Yeah, so I think um, the main thing is kind of equipping them with the right devices to do what they need, whether that's desktop, if they're based at a desk or smartphone or tablet, whether you kind of bring your own device policy um, or equipping them with tablets. Um, we find the main thing we have is actually just this kind of role of the host who has a tablet, they can do everything on that tablet. They can see where all of their colleagues are in the store, who's serving which customer, what that customer is there to discuss, and they can add customers on the other side um, and assign them over to the right colleagues. So they basically have control over the whole shop floor and they can see what's going on. You can then layer that with colleagues kind of connecting from their own desktops or tablets to see what their colleagues are doing and who their next customer is. Um, but essentially it's, it's managing your experience and your operations in one device and by doing that you're capturing data on your entire piece of everything that's happening between the door and the till and kind of bridging that data gap that you don't have in store that you do have online um, so for example with our system not only are you managing customers but you can also see your colleagues and put them on break um, a lot of the store teams that we work with said before this I had no idea like someone would come up to me and say I'm going to take my lunch break and I'd look at my watch and I'd forget what time I looked at my watch and they're probably taking an extra kind of five or ten minutes not not even on purpose but um, now with Kudini they can kind of it, we basically show a counter of how when that colleague went on break and when they're due back and it's really simple things like that just make the store team feel more in control of what's going on and then the data enables them to really kind of power their one-to-ones with the store team at the start of the day to say okay you served this many customers this yes yesterday it took this long for these types of customers we should be targeting this time um, and helping them basically convert more customers that way because they are your most, most important sales resource. So how do you optimize how they work? And Eric, I wonder um, from your perspective with Radar, um, I mean, who is, I assume it's it's obviously at an organizational level, but at a store level um, that folks are utilizing your technology. Um, just sort of like anecdotally are like, do you feel like employees are sort of craving these kind of like technology forward experiences to make their jobs easier, et cetera? I'm definitely biased, but what we're <laughs> seeing, absolutely. I would say one, there is a labor shortage in retail specifically because of COVID, because minimum wages are rising. If you go into any mall or ones that still exist, or you walk down Fifth Avenue, you see help wanted signs in all stores. And with this mm -hmm. added uh, COVID uh, acceleration of curbside pickup, the store associate has more work to do than ever with less support to do that work. So whether that's pick packing and shipping items, whether it's looking up products for customers, whether that's changing the floor sets, all of those operational tasks for front and back of house. So when you give them a technology that automates that for them, whether that's finding items or pick packing and shipping items or you know preparing items for curbside pickup, it's, it's huge for them. It, it allows them to do what would take three associates, you know, overnight, something that could take them 20 minutes right when they get into the store. So we are definitely seeing a hunger for that. Furthermore, one of the things we don't speak about also, and this is specific to retail, is churn is normally high. It's higher than it's ever been, right? So the training, the offboarding, the onboarding, it happens way quicker. Um, and you're getting a lot of young employees, you're getting a lot of new employees that are new to retail. Uh, and so to give tools that kind of automates it right when they get there and makes it as easy as possible is something that I would say store management and district managers want for their teams so that they can say, hey, here's an app, here's a tool. It has the communications you need to know. It has the tasks that you need to do. And it automates everything from restock and replan and fulfillment and all of these other things. So it it makes the retailers more competitive as well when they're going out to hire employees. If they say, hey, we have all of this set up. It's as easy to use as social media or other apps that you're using, banking apps on a daily basis. Come in, do your shift. It's, it's all done right in there versus the burnout that you're seeing happen for stores that don't have technology and it's very manual for all of the processes. And Philip, I'm curious what your perspective is in terms of, um, you know, obviously when you were at Beta, this the store associates had, I believe, technology in hand that they were utilizing. Um, what was, what were you hearing from them? What, what were your sort of takeaways in terms of like how other retailers should be thinking about putting technology in the hands of their own associates? Yeah, I mean, I echo it with. 
Imogen and, and um, Eric you know, said, I mean, look, I mean, I started my career working in stores. And I mean, you know, you realize that one, it's about empowering people to make, to be able to have the ability to make decisions. You treat people, you know, like with, with respect and, and, and treat them like intelligent individuals. And I, I think for the longest time, you know, retail associates were treated as kind of, you know, it was almost seen as like a second class job. And now you're seeing wages coming much higher. You're seeing that they can, the, the, the um, generally just the table stakes have, have, uh, have risen. And I think it's, you know, as Eric was mentioning, you have to be able to provide these technological tools that people use every day in their lives. They're so used to it. Everything's automated. And then when you have something that's very manual, it's, it's challenging for people to want to adopt, you know, those types of things. And I think the other thing too, that we, that we used to do is that it was connecting people so that, you know, we found that like there were relationships that people had, you know, in, in a store, maybe somebody was working in Santa Monica, had a, you know, a strong relationship with somebody who was working in Chicago who they had never met. Maybe they had actually you know, met over um, on video, but like they had these strong relationships that they had because they were constantly talking with one another and empowering this ability. And when you give people, you know, it was always like, well, you can't have a cell phone, you can't have a tablet because all you're just going to be doing is going to be just, you're going to be distracted, you're going to be online. Like that's, that's bullshit, right? I mean, like, sorry, it's like, you know, like, no, get, again, if you trust people, if you, if you were hiring good people and you give them autonomy to make decisions, then they're going to go ahead and do the right thing. And they're going to be, you know, as pretty much like the, there's the people that they are your kind of last mile, right? I mean, they are the individuals who are there who have the most access to information, who are engaging with people, with the consumer and really make the, the difference between whether your business ultimately is going to be successful or not. And I think, you know, I think I'm, I'm finally happy to see that the tide's shifting of how, you know, companies are, re are having to not only pay, but also that the tools that they're providing um, their retail teams. And Trevor, obviously <clears throat> your technology is a little bit more fo focused on the consumer versus the employee, but at the same time, at the end of the day, someone might need to be on hand to kind of walk the consumer through that process, or at least, um, you know, ensure that things are running smoothly. What what do you see from when you're sort of bringing solution to bear at retail? Some of the ways that companies can do that in a in a successful way. Well, I think I think this conversation is interesting in part because of the way that we default approached this, which is. Oh, the retailer is doing all the retail tech, right? They're the ones who are responsible for it. When, you know, often it's the brands that can bring in technology to the end caps that they own. And so, you know, that's actually the majority of our model is, you know, providing those tools because we know the retailers, you know, you know, we, we can wait until Target has, everybody has an iPad and, you know, has Salesforce, Tulip and all these tools and wonderful apps. But the reality is that's pretty far off. And if you're a brand that needs to sell now, how do you get the message out or, you know, are you just letting your product sit at the shelf? And so, you know, one of the things that I think that digital display and especially intelligent display that's smart, that understands which products you're touching so they give you the right message at the right time is like, for the first time, brands can control a lot of their, um, their destiny and how uh, consumers and shoppers are perceiving their brands. And, and, and their ability to collect data. And they can do it in a way that partners with the retailer to drive category lift, to do cross-sell, to promote their retailer offerings, where it's like, you know, at Kroger, they care about, you know, leading with fresh and their loyalty reward program. It's like, okay, great. Every time somebody touches this product, I will tell them about the loyalty reward program. And so there are ways that brands can do this to strengthen the retailer relationship, gather new data, but also take control of their destiny. And I think, you know, even though we don't necessarily need a sales associate, sales associates love Perch because, you know, what do shoppers want when they're interested in a product? We know this from online. They want videos, ratings, reviews, descriptions, et cetera, et cetera. And yet none of that's really available in store. We, we talk about how the store is this great place for product discovery, but it's missing all the content to actually make a decision. And when you bring that to the shelf, the sales associates, you know, comes over and can guide them through an experience and feel, you know, much more trusted because it's not that I'm saying it, I'm showing it to you and, and, and providing information and guiding you through that. And I think that provides all these new pathways for how people interact either in a self-serve mode or a sales associate assisted mode. Awesome. That's great. And, and sort of 
double clicking on the sort of idea of self-serving automation, which has come up a little bit already in the, in the conversation. Um, you know, there's a lot that's been discussed and it, it already kind of came up a little bit with um, thinking about com computer vision and, and Eric touched on this with the sort of Amazon stores. I'm just kind of curious, I, I know this maybe isn't um, any of your sort of realm of possibilities, but, or, realm of expertise, but um, what do we think about this sort of just walkout technology and the sort of automation of stores? Is this something that is going to catch on at a sort of high level? Is there some middle ground that were that's more sort of appealing to consumers? I'm just kind of curious to get a sense from, from you all. Yeah. So I would say from what we're seeing, um, it's getting adopted one in the APAC region, more in apparel, groceries, convenience, uh, in India as well for convenience in the Kiranas. But for here with Amazon and Center Cognition, it's only in these smaller stores like in airports and certain stores because the cost is very high. You have to put a camera every five square feet. Sometimes you need a shelf weight. Um, you have to have humans in the loop to review camera footage sometimes when you're not exactly sure. And that's why the receipts will be an hour later. I will say stores like Walmart, Target, um, big supermarkets are very much interested in this. And because sometimes the, the cashiers take, you know, 10 to 15% of their, you know, floor space. And beyond that, cashiers are their most expensive labor cost. And so there's a desire, especially in these kind of high frequency, low interaction spaces like convenience stores or groceries to for sure automate that. I think when you get into luxury, when we're talking to some of the other retailers, one, there's a fear that they don't want to replace the loss prevention theft tag because it's a deterrent. And two, they want this high touch interaction. So if you're a Foot Locker or a Nike, they have to go get the shoe anyway to give it to you and they, there's an opportunity to build that relationship. If you're a Chanel, et cetera, you don't want someone to grab a handbag and just walk out. It's not the concierge experience that they want. So from our perspective, I think you'll see it more in groceries, but the data piece that's enabled by the same technology will already be there. And I think over time, there will be some hybrid solution for that as well. Fantastic, Eric. Thank you. Is just to sort of think about beyond the sort of just walk out, um, what convenience kind of looks like more broadly within retail moving forward, um, either from a, an appointment perspective, from a sort of fulfillment perspective. I just maybe maybe Imogen, you can you can start off and kind of share some thoughts there. So, yeah, I mean, we basically with the appointment scheduling, we found that when people can plan their time, um, they're much more likely to convert. And also it's mm, massively increases the number of new customers acquired. So with all of our customers, about 60 percent of the people that book appointments have not been to the retailer before because they've just made it so simple and easy to engage with them that they're like, OK, well, I might as well. Um, as well as you've got the colleague who can also better prepare for the appointment because he knows who's coming in and what they want to discuss. So for us, that's kind of convenience through better service, um, as well as also the kind of the, the click and collect has been an interesting shift or the BOPIS because um, previously retailers wanted customers to come into the store because they're more likely to buy something. I think like some of our clients were finding they, they'd spend kind of an average of $9 while they're walking around. Um, but if you're offering them a better pickup experience, they're more likely to return to your online channels again and again. So I think that kind of value is massively increased. Um, in terms of the kind of the hybrid um, uh, store walkout thing, I, I never know. Um, I think when I think about the AI revolution that we'll see, the key roles that are, I see existing are creativity and sales people. Um, so I think those people um, should be redeployed to sales roles. And what I find strange with the Amazon stores is they have people in the back, but they just don't put them out there to build relationships. So 
um, everyone's relationship with Amazon is just this kind of machine or a computer. Um, whereas I think we might see other retailers kind of reusing, reutilizing their colleagues in a more interesting um, way that builds brand value. I also think it comes down to the type of product you're selling, right? I mean, Eric alluded to that. I mean, it's, it's you know, for example, you know, at, at model number, like we're moved, I mean, we carry no inventory, right? I mean, we sell, you know, luxury high-end furniture and, you know, and it's all built and we don't manufacture, we don't pre-manufacture anything. Everything is kind of, you know, customized or made to order. And so you're going to start to see this, I think, not just only in the furniture space, but you're going to see it in, even in apparel and other areas where, again, people are okay. Like, certain things when you walk into a convenience store you want it as fast and you want the, the process to be as seamless as possible so you want to be able to just walk out with something and then there's other things you're okay waiting for right as a consumer um i mean we're waiting for a lot of things these days and so i think you'd be comfortable with the certain um, wait times obviously you want those to be as short as possible but you also realize that you're getting something that's personalized that maybe it's a little bit more customized that, that that's tailored to you and so in that you want a, a more of a relationship that exists I think in your shopping experience. So I think you're gonna find almost like a, you know, really just um, kind of a, a bifurcation of, of kind of those experiences where there's, like, I wanna be this in and out as fast as possible and in a seamless experience. And where you're gonna see the, that level of, of even more, you know, less hands-on. And then I think people are gonna even ratchet up the, the customer service and the things that they want out of other experiences because you realize you're sitting down um, and you're gonna devote the time because you realize that it's, it's something that is important to you and something that you're passionate about. You answered a question that I, that I hadn't asked yet, but that was perfect, Philip. I think, you know, I see speed is one side of convenience and then quality is, is another, which obviously you touched on and Imogen touched on in terms of like how you're helping consumers sort of make best use of their time or have, um, the best experience or what have you. So I think those are, I think that's really interesting way of kind of thinking about things. Um, as a final question, and, and again, this can be, you know, your solution could be the thing, but I'm, I'm curious as we sort of look ahead to 2022 and, and beyond, um, you know, what's one technology or technology use case that you feel will have the, the biggest impact on, on physical retail moving forward. And Trevor, I will um, toss it to you first um, to, to give your response. Yeah, I mean, so, so any technological innovation? Any technological innovation. You know, it, it's a tricky question because you can go really specific or really broad, right? And you could say something like data, um, but I, I, I think, to me, it's computer vision. I kind of hit on that a little bit earlier. I, I think we're uncovering what really is happening in stores and starting to attribute what that behavior means for retailers, for brands. I think brands are going to come to realize that the way they're marketing their products, you know, uh, is, I don't want to say all wrong, but suboptimal. Um, and, you know, for me, what, what what's exciting about in-store retail is you look at e-commerce and you're like, okay, we've squeezed a lot out of that, right? You know, and Facebook is squeezing all your, you know, cost of acquisition out even more. But, you know, maybe maybe you'll do some, you know, live streaming and social shopping. We'll, we'll eke out a little bit more. But, you know, it's an iterative improvement. And I think computer vision is going to lead to a disruptive and revolutionary improvement in the way we think about physical and in-store retail. And so when I think about how much better in-store retail can be, even as it maintains 85% of transaction volumes, even as it's the key to profitability now, what it could be could be so much more. And I think, you know, ultimately that starts with understanding and everybody is flying blind. Um, and that's starting to change. And we're uncovering insights that are just overturning you know, decades of wisdom about how things are done. And uh, that to me is the most exciting piece and, and most exciting technology uh, that's gonna transform retail. Amazing. Um, any Eric Imogen thoughts, builds? Uh I would say anything that enables you to know your customer better. So I think that kind of encompasses the computer vision, the clienteling side, 
Um, as well as I'm really interested in services that enable customer, uh, customers to customize products, so kind of go and play with it, whether it comes online, so the kind of Nike by you style services. And I'll add, there's that famous technology quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. I don't think anything we're going to see in retail stores is going to be crazy new technology. I just think people are waking up to the fact that they do need to integrate technology and build the right experiences to keep their customers and keep up the excitement. So I think whether it's 5G or things like appointment scheduling or leveraging screens in stores or just anything to track data, I think more and more retailers are thinking, as Philip said earlier, holistically um, about the commerce experience. Yeah, and I would, I would say, you know, like what Trevor said, I think on the machine learning and, and revision side of things, I think on the commodity side of the business, I 100% agree with it. That's absolutely, I would say more on the, in the luxury high-end kind of area, it's going to come down to tools that allow for greater customization and personalization. Amazing. And, and I love the fact that, you know, in all of these technologies and solutions that we've talked about, there's the sort of core function that it is servicing, whether it's for the employee or for the consumer. But, you know, again, to use that term holistic, there's so many other things that it needs to sort of do in order to justify its sort of overall investment. So... Philip, Eric, Imogen, Trevor, thank you all so much for sharing all of your great insights with the audience today and really appreciate that and um, good luck and the best in 2022. We just saw that session where we had a number of experts talk about uh, technology in the store. And now we wanna conclude with a spotlight on, a, on a, an innovative solution provider, Merkel. I'm going to continue to kind of deep dive into kind of the new ideas that are taking place in the store and the use of technology along the customer experience journey. With me today, I've got Val Vacante. Val Vacante is the Director of Strategy and Product Innovation at Merkel. Um, it's great to have you here, Val. Thanks, Piers. It's always great to be at Retail Innovation Week. Thank you. Let's talk about the philosophy Merkel has when it, it, it creates technology for customers in retail? At Merkel, we've designed a suite of products called Shop Next, and they're retail innovations bringing customer joy. And I talked with the team and others as we started, you know, getting our ideas out into the world. And it's also about bringing retailers joy too. Um, all the products are super lightweight, future focused. Um, they're compatible with major e-commerce platforms, and they're really designed about the every step of the customer experience. So from in-store exploration to contactless payment to, hey, what happens when you actually open the box in your home? That's um, super interesting. I'm keen to kind of uh, jump in and find out more about uh, these three different products that are part of your suite. So maybe you can introduce them. Our first product we're very excited to share with you all. We just announced it at CES and it's called Scan and Know. And it's all about no more in store. Uh, it's the world's first app free product recognition technology from Merkel. Uh, and really, what's great about it is it, it, it's an extension of a retailer's existing website integrates into existing customer profiles and loyalty programs. So really empowering customers to find out things like prices, um, you know, those, those wedding and baby registries where we always sort of have to go around with the RF gun. It, retailers don't need that hardware anymore for customers. And, and the other great part about it is that you can actually ship items to your door or add them to your wish list. All types of retailers can use this and all types of customers can use this in different occasions as well. Absolutely. So whether you're sort of a small retailer um, and, for example, there's a, a soap company, White Rock Soap Gallery, that we've recently done some tests with. Um, they use a lot of natural products, vegan products. Um, customers want to know that and they'll go in the shop and they're, they're in there trying to find out like what ingredients are in that. That's interesting. Tell us about the second product that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the second product is called Scan and Go, and it's a VIP checkout free experience. And you're absolutely right, Piers. 
Um, it is actually leveraging the same technology. It's the exact same technology that we have in Scan and Know. However, um, it does enable you to have that contactless payment experience in store. So if you if if I if I grab this bar of soap. I scan it. Uh, again, it's in with my existing profile, loyalty program and all that. I scan it, I buy it, I'm served up with a digital receipt. Um, and the brilliant part that our, our team worked through is instead of just sort of a, a regular barcode receipt, again, where a retailer might need an RF gun, the digital receipt is also a QR code. So again, making it easy for the retailer, their exiteer person, uh, they can simply use their smartphone to make to check the receipt on the way out. Um, again, integrates into the retailer's existing website, customer profiles, and loyalty programs. Yeah, seems easy to implement and uses technology that staff are familiar with. Um, and then you have a third product as well um, that you've been talking about. The second one, obviously, is Scan and Go, as we talked about that VIP checkout free experience. And then with Unbox It, we're taking it to the home and that on delivery experience. Um, Unbox It is our app free smart packaging content platform. Um, again, like I say, app free. So when a customer receives their package, they scan the note in the package. They're immediately launched into content kind of designed around three key pillars. The first one is getting started. So that's everything like your tips, your tricks, your tools, your instructions um, to get you onboarded. The second one is join the club. And so that's everything from those exclusive experiences we may want to offer customers to loyalty programs, subscriptions, product reminders. And then the third one kind of rounding it out is share the love. So really getting customers connected with your social media community, customer reviews, um, any kind of brand ambassadorships, but getting them excited, uh, rallied around the brand and also giving them that immediate customer support um, upon delivery. And the, the sort of last thing that's really great for retailers and marketers is the content platform is no code technology. So if, if, you're a, if you're a marketing manager and say you have a flash sale come up and you've got lots of product shipping at the moment um, with that message, with that QR code on it, you can swiftly go in there and just sort of drag and drop your content. Again, no code, you don't have to bother the web team or anything like that. And then boom, you can enhance that message off the bat seems to me that built throughout all of these products is this kind of uh, philosophy of making it very easy for the retailer to plug and play. That's exactly right. Um, all of these products, all three of the Shop Next products, they're designed for retailers to be able to kind of jump in, uh, test and learn in the matter of weeks uh, for, for all three products. Yeah. Um, maybe they work for some retailers, maybe they try it out and one product doesn't work and they want to, they want to try another one. We really encourage that. Um, and that's kind of the idea to your point earlier, you know, technology moving fast, what technologies do we want to try? We want to make it as easy and quick as possible for retailers. So our, our shop next suite of products houses three key products, as you pointed out, Pierce. The first one is scan and know which is all about no more in store. So it's app free product recognition technology. The second one is scan and go uh, designed about creating that VIP checkout free experience. Again, app free contactless payment technology, uh, both scan and know and scan and go integrate into your existing website, customer profiles and loyalty programs. And then kind of rounding it out is Unbox It. And that's our app-free smart packaging content platform um, that allows marketers to jump in, update their messaging, create that onboarding experience with no code technology. Well, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing. Valva Kante, uh, Director of Strategy and Product Innovation at Merkel, it's been great to hear about how you're bringing joy not only to the customer, to the retailer today. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. It's always great to be at Retail Innovation Week.
This event has been curated around the findings of the latest retail innovation reports by the researchers at the Business Intelligence Service PSFK. Visit psfk.com to learn how you can download this report with a subscription to PSFK IQ, a library of 400 innovation reports and 150,000 supporting examples and data points. PSFK IQ are innovators turn for research. Well, I think you'd agree that was super exciting. Thanks to everybody for joining. Thank you to the speakers for being part of that. Thanks to the PSFK team for moderating and presenting. Um, and thanks for all the comments made in the forum and uh we're excited to uh to have had you here today and uh we have new events coming up very soon and i hope you can join us for those events too from piers fox founder of retail innovation week uh, i appreciate your time today thank you until next time